On August 10th, 1628, this was the most powerful weapon in the world. 20 minutes later, it was at the bottom of Stockholm Harbor. There aren't any physical signs of damage. The wood hasn't been set ablaze, ripped apart by a reef, or blown apart with cannons. So why did this warship never see war? Who sank the Vasa? Let's relive the fateful day of the sinking. After being dragged along the eastern shorefront from the Steps Garden shipyard, the Vasa was ready to take sail. Named for his family, the Vasa dynasty, King Gustavus Adolphus of Sweden was anxious for her to join him fighting in the Thirty Years' War. On board are sailors and their families, while along the shore thousands waited to see the flagship of the Swedish Navy take to the seas. All the gun ports along both the lower and upper decks are opened, ready to fire a salute as the ship leaves Stockholm. After unfurling her sails, she makes her way steadily through the port. Just as she rounds Beckholen Island, a strong gust of wind makes the ship bank heavily to port. In fact, so far does she lean that the lower gun ports become submerged. As water rushes in, the fate of the ship is sealed, and she sinks in a matter of minutes. Since they hadn't gone very far, most of the passengers and crew make it safely back to shore, where the captain is immediately arrested. Suffering Hansen swears that everything had been tied down properly, and that his crew was sober. So if the sailors weren't to blame, why did she sink? All ocean vessels operate under the same two forces, weight and buoyancy. To see how these interact, I've created this demonstration. The top tank is filled with water. If any of it gets displaced, it's going to spill out and into the larger container. We'll be able to measure the weight of displaced water using a set of scales. This is an analog for the Vasa ship. It weighs in at precisely 37 grams. When we place it into the tank, some of the water spills out. How much water? 37 grams of it. We're now adding in some cargo, about 65 grams of it. The extra weight pulls the boat down further, but it doesn't sink. At the same time, more water spills out. How much water? About 65 grams. As you can see, the mass of water displaced is always the same as the mass of the object. That's because displaced water generates buoyancy, which is opposed by the object's mass, which generates weight. In the end, the boat sinks just far enough to exactly counter the extra mass. It was 1625, and King Gustavus had a problem. Up until the 17th century, the Swedish Navy had focused on smaller, faster vessels, well suited for the boarding rather than outright sinking of ships. However, as cannon technology advanced, he saw an opportunity for a new type of warfare. When, during the height of the Thirty Years' War, ten of his ships sank during a storm, Gustavus informed his shipwrights that they would be building a new flagship, using the latest in technology. The Vasa was equipped with 64 cannons across two gun decks, including 48 of these 24-pounders. At the time, this was the Baltic's largest concentration of artillery on a single vessel. But flagships aren't just about firepower, they're also political statements. You can see on this one-tenth scale replica the brightly coloured ornamentation of the Vasa. Scenes from Roman and Greek antiquity are intertwined with figures from the Old Testament as well as ancient Egypt. All of this propaganda and extra cannons puts a lot of mass high up in the ship. Just having equal forces isn't enough. They've also got to be balanced. In its initial configuration, our boat is really stable. That's because the cargo makes the weight force act through a point that's lower than the buoyancy force. If we tilt it to the side, these forces generate a restorative torque back to the center. On the other hand, if we were to increase the height of the cargo, then it's a lot less stable. Buoyancy acts through the same point, but now the weight force is much higher up. If the ship tips even a little, then this tilt gets magnified. We can prevent tipping in two ways. Lower the center of mass by adding in more weight lower down, or by making the base wider so that it must lean further before falling over. When Gustavus ordered the Vasa to be built, the shipwrights had already started construction on a smaller vessel. Rather than wasting the resources, 
Instead, they just extended the already formed keel by 8 meters, bringing total ship length up to 70. In order to compensate for this instability, they added as much ballast as possible. However, the narrower profile of the ship made it much less effective. After 120 tons were added, the ship was sailing too low in the water. Any more mass, and the water would start to spill through the gun ports. Before the Vast could launch, it had to pass a lurch test. This involves having 30 men run side to side along the deck, making the ship rock back and forth. By doing so, we can infer the relative positioning of the weight and buoyancy forces. In Pirates of the Caribbean, they use an especially exaggerated form of this test to flip the Black Pearl. After just three traversals, it was decided that the Vasa was lurching way too far, and the test had to be abandoned. For comparison, it took Jack Sparrow and his crew more than 10 times that amount before their ship would sink. At this stage, someone should probably have told the engineers, or even the king, that the ship was unseaworthy. However, it appears the message never got through, and with Gustavus at war and anxious for the Vasa to join him, the launch date was set for August 10th. The rest, as they say, is history. So, at the end of the day, who sank the Vasa? The official inquest found that no one was to blame. The captain was just sailing a ship that had indeed passed a test, and was built to specifications outlined by the king himself. Were the courts really going to accuse the most powerful man in Sweden of sinking his own warship? Probably not. <laughs>